ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد so today 16th of september 2021 we continue inshallah with the explanation of usul sunnah of the imam of ahlus sunnah wal jamaa ahmed bin muhammad ibn hanbal al-shaybani rahimahullah ta'ala the great scholar well known for his defense of the aqeedah and his pursuit of hadith and his famous and tremendous work the musnad of imam ahmed and likewise his works in aqeedah and masail and the various questions that were posed to him that many of his students have compiled which are referred to as the masail and many other works that this great imam had from them is this one that we are pursuing in explaining and completing and that is usul sunnah of imam ahmed so we reached the point last week where we mentioned the descent of isa ibn maryam and before that the appearance of the dajjal so today he moves on by mentioning that the foundations of the sunnah with us usul sunnati indana and then he reaches the point that the foundation of sunnah with us and then he said and to have iman that iman and to believe that iman is qawlun wa amalun wal imanu qawlun wa amalun yazidu wa yanqus kama jaa fi al khabar akmal al mu'minina imanan ahsanuhum khuluqa so here he discusses and opens up the the point pertaining to the belief of ahlus sunnah regarding the topic of iman and that is that iman is speech and action and that is the definition of iman when you want to ask you what is the definition of iman with ahlus sunnah then iman is qawlun wa amalun yazidu wa yanqus that iman is speech and action it increases and it decreases just as they occurs in the hadith of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wherein he said that the most perfect the most perfect of the believers are those with the best of manners and that hadith which is authentic upon Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reported by uh, imam muslim barakallahu feekum now and other as far as i recall by imam muslim let me just now inshallah maybe we'll come back to it if they, if it needs to be corrected nevertheless the point here being that iman is speech and action what is the intent what is the intent of the statement of imam ahmed that it is speech and action then speech and action refers here to the speech of the heart the speech of the tongue and the actions refer to the actions of the heart and the actions of the limbs So this is what is intended by qawlun wa amalun speech and action what is speech of the heart speech of the heart is the knowledge in the heart pertaining to the sharia belief in allah belief in the angels belief in the messengers belief in belief in the books belief in the last day and the belief in the qadr it's good and it's evil and the rest of the affairs that are pertaining to the sharia of al islam So that information that knowledge is known as speech of the heart. So that is the ilm of the sharia that is held in the heart that is qawl qawlul qalb it is referred to as speech of the heart. As for amal as for the speech rather of the tongue then speech of the tongue is to that which is in the heart by way of that knowledge of that speech in the heart then to convey it upon the tongue then it is speech of the, then that is what is referred to as speech of the tongue so of course it includes the shahadatain to testify that none has the right to be worshiped except for allah 
and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger, and dhikr and the recitation of the Quran, and the enjoining of the good with the tongue, with one speech, and the forbidden of the evil, and the recitation of the Quran, and the making of the dua when you utter upon the tongue, then all of that is speech of the tongue. So, Iman is speech of the heart, meaning it is that knowledge of the Sharia in one's heart. And it is speech of the tongue, meaning that it is the conveyance of that which is in the heart upon the tongue. As for Amalul Qalb, or what is, what is intended by Amal here, what is the intent of the Iman is action, then it means actions of the heart. Actions of the heart. And likewise, actions of the limbs. Actions of the heart of those affairs in the heart that cause the heart to tremble and cause the heart to move, such as fear and love and hope and terror and tawakkul and reliance and trust in Allah. All of those affairs are referred to as actions for obvious reasons. They are referred to as the actions of the heart. Actions of the limbs is to act upon the sharia, just as speech of the tongue is to act, is to speak with the sharia and that, what, that which it entails and likewise, Actions of the limbs, such as the prayer and jihad and fasting and the giving of zakah, all of these are actions of the limbs, sajda, ruku', raising of the hands, all of these are amal. So therefore when we say iman is qawlun wa amal, then it is qawl, it is statement in two places, statement of the heart, statement of the tongue. Amal actions then actions are in two places actions of the heart and actions of the limbs yazidu yanqus it increases and it decreases meaning that it increases in obedience to allah the iman the more that you uh, the more that you perform actions of the heart the stronger your iman the more that you perform actions of the limbs the stronger your iman, your iman increases with actions of the limbs and actions of the heart. The more that you fear Allah, the stronger your iman. The more that you make dhikr of Allah, speech of the tongue, the stronger your iman. And the more that your iman increases. And this is the link between the speech of the heart and the actions of the heart. Speech of the heart and speech of the tongue. Speech of the heart and actions of the limbs. Meaning, it is that knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is that which you know from the kitab and from the sunnah. And the sharia of Allah, which comprises the kitab and the sunnah. That knowledge that you have in the heart, the more that you have of that knowledge, the more you will, your actions of the heart will increase. Because the more that you know, the more that you love Allah, the more that you hope in Allah, the more that you desire Allah, the more that you fear Allah. And likewise, the more that you know, the more you will utter. So if you know a dhikr, which you know because you've memorized it, it is in your heart, the more that you have that knowledge and then you repeat that upon the tongue, it increases your iman. The more knowledge that you have, the more that you have this qawlul qalb, this, uh, this, this speech of the heart, the more that you will act upon the limbs because it is necessary. There is a necessary bi you know, a binding between all of these affairs. Speech of the heart leads to action in the heart. Speech of the heart and action of the heart leads to speech upon the tongue. Actions of the limbs are indicative of what is in the heart. So when a person has no outward actions and he says, but my iman is strong in my heart, then that is not possible. We don't say that you have no iman in your heart, but you're, if you have righteous deeds, if you perform righteous actions, then that is indicative of what is in your heart of iman in both speech and action. But if you outwardly don't remember Allah, okay, you're a Muslim, you, t you make the shahada. And every, every so often, every few months, you may make dhikr or you may make a dua if you're, you know, if you're, uh, if, if you're in the mood for it. But, you know, you don't do much else in terms of righteous deeds. You don't 
if you're a sister, you don't wear the hijab. If you're a brother, you don't you know, perform any of the, or you don't have outwardly the practice of the sunnah. Then your outward actions show us that the iman in the heart is weak. Because there is a link between all of these affairs. A link that is strong. And this is why we say that iman and the definition of iman is speech and action. A person cannot say that iman is very strong in my heart. And yet he doesn't pray. I'm a strong believer. But he doesn't pray. He doesn't fast. He doesn't give zakat. He doesn't grow his beard. He doesn't, he doesn't raise his trousers above his ankles. Or she doesn't wear the hijab. Or she doesn't pray. Or you listen to music. Or that you lie and you deceive and you cheat. And you steal. And then you say that my iman is strong. Yet you have all of these sins and acts of disobedience. And that is proof actually of the weakness of your iman. Not the strength of your iman. And, the, and this is why he mentioned the proof. That the most perfect of the believers in, in Iman are those who are best in manners. Manners are those actions of the limbs and speech of the tongue. How you behave, how you speak, how you interact with others, how you deal with the people. You know, the, the manner in which you buy and sell from them. The way that you treat your wife or the wife treats her husband. Or the way that you raise your children. Or how you are with your parents. And how you are with your neighbors. Right? How are your manners? When the Prophet, when Aisha radiallahu anha was asked. What were the manners of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? She said his khuluq or his manners. Was the Quran. His manners were the Quran. So meaning. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Acted upon the injunctions of the Quran. Upon the rules and the obligations that are found in the Quran and that which the Quran calls to. So therefore, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was complete in Iman. You know, he was the most, you know, he had completed every level of Iman as Ibn Qayyim Rahimahullah Ta'ala mentioned. You know, because if you look at the regulations of Islam, that they are five, the ahkam of Islam are five, right? That which is, that which is wajib. Well, let's begin, you know, before that. You know, that, that which is muba, that which is mukru, or that which is mustahab, that which is wajib, and that which is haram. These are the five ahkam of, ahkam of the sharia. Meaning that which is obligated, that which is recommended, that which is mubah, meaning that which is allowable, for which there is no punishment or, or reward, that which is mukru, meaning that it is, if you leave it, there is reward for you, but if you do it, there is no sin upon you. And then that which is haram, that which is prohibited. If you do it, then you are sinful. If you leave it, you are rewarded. As for wajib, if you do it, you are rewarded. If you leave it, you are sinful. So these are the five ahkam of the sharia. And these five ahkam of the sharia are established upon three parts of your body. The heart, the tongue, and the limbs. Are they not? They are things that are haram for you in your heart, like evil suspicions and jealousy, right? And arrogance and pride. These are things in the heart, right? Kibar and jealousy and hatred, hiqt, rancor. You know, these kind of things are actions of the heart that are wicked and evil and not permissible for a Muslim. So the ahkam of the sharia are applied, all five of them, on each part of those three parts. How much is that in total? Fifteen. Five in the heart, five upon the tongue, five upon the limbs. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam completed all fifteen. So as far as his heart was concerned, that he fulfilled all of the ahkam of the Sharia, kept away from that which was haram, did that which was oblig obligated upon him. Rather he increased upon that by way of that which Allah loved. So he would increase in, 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 upon his speech and upon the actions of the heart. And likewise, the actions of the limbs. The Prophet ﷺ completed all 15 levels of Iman. So this is why when we talk about Rasulullah ﷺ and Aisha radiallahu anha said that as for the manners of the Prophet ﷺ, then his manners and his character was the Qur'an. 
because he never disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He only did that which Allah commanded him to do. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that was his, throughout the whole of his life, alayhi salatu wa salam, he strived in obedience to Allah and keeping away from that which Allah had prohibited from him. And he kept away from that which Allah disliked and that which Allah was displeased with. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went the extra mile to do that which, which pleased Allah, even if it wasn't obligatory, such as tahajjud, he would never miss it. Siwak, he would always use it. And so on. This is Rasulullah, alayhi salatu wa salam. As for the rest of us, then to one degree or another, it just depends at which of those, how much of those 15 levels we've reached. How many times do we disobey Allah? How many times do we obey Allah? How many times do we increase our iman further? By doing that which is recommended from the nawafil, fasting for example. The voluntary fast or the optional fast. The sunan, the, 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 you know, the sunan al-rawatib. The sunan that are connected to the obligatory prayers. And likewise the nawafil or the, you know, those, those prayers that are, you know, prayed throughout the day. Like for example, the tahajjud, doha prayer. They're not necessarily connected to any of the obligatory prayers because they are not from the rawatib. But they are optional prayers for which there is an immense reward. The raka'atain, for example, the two raka'as after performing wudu. The two raka'as between the adhan and the iqama. So these are all extra things that a person can do. What do you do? What happens every time you do that? What happens every time you make that extra dhikr? You know, that extra alhamdulillah or that extra subhanallah. وَبِحَمْدِهِ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ الْأَذِيمِ When you make these extra statements of dhikr by saying Allahu Akbar or La ilaha illallah every time a person does that his iman increases this is why we say that iman increases with speech iman increases with actions the more tahajjud iman increases also just by you walking in the street and you see a thorn or you see a branch in the road and you move it out the way. So you move it out the way and you do not do it except because you want the pleasure of Allah. And in a hadith of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reported by Bukhari in Adab al-Mufrat that a man saw a thorn in the road and he thought this is going to harm the Muslims so I'm going to move it out the way so that the Muslims aren't harmed. And because of that Allah entered him into Jannah. So therefore these actions that we perform they increase a person in iman. The more that you do, the more sadaqah that you give. We're not talking about zakat because zakat is wajib. Of course, if you give zakat, then the iman increases. And you are rewarded. And you have fulfilled the pillar of Islam. Because if you abandon the giving of zakat, then you are a major sinner. But now a person has paid his zakat. Now he wants to do more. He wants to give sadaqah. What happens to his iman? Increases even further. Iman increases even further. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu said that Iman is of 60 and odd branches in a narration. 70 and odd branches. The highest branch of Iman is what? Qawlu La ilaha illallah. The Qawl to say La ilaha illallah. So that's the highest level of Iman. That Qawl. Qawlun La ilaha illallah. So the highest level of Iman out of all of the Prophet ﷺ mentioning the 60 and 70 odd branches is the kalima. It is the most beloved word to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the heaviest on the scale, yawmul qiyamah. And it is the kalima that will save a person from the hellfire, as in the hadith of Hudayfa radiallahu anhu. That they will say, la ilaha illa ya Rasulullah, how will la ilaha benefit them when they are not doing this and they are not praying and they are not, you know, before the hour is established that a time will come when the people will only know la ilaha illa Allah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said to him, it will save them. It will save them. La ilaha illallah will save the people. So it is the highest level of Iman. Right? And the lowest level of Iman is to move an object, an obstacle from the path, just like moving a branch. So you're walking down the road and you see that there's maybe some rubbish in the way. Or a branch has fallen down. Or someone's just left something. You know, they've left their... They've, they've taken their black bin liner out and they've just thrown it into the path. So you're walking by, so you walk in the road just to get out of its way and you carry on. 
Then the next one comes, he walks in the road to get out of its way, to, get, to carry on. But it's in the path, it's on the pathway, it's, in, it's on the streets, it's on the pavement. So you come along and you pick, up, you pick it up and you move it out the way so that the people can use the pavement. Has that not increased a person in Iman? It's an increase in Iman. And likewise, the Prophet Sallallahu said that Al-Haya, Al-Haya, meaning modesty and shame is a branch from the branches of Iman. And modesty and shame is in the heart. So this hadith proves that Iman is in the heart because, she, because of the end of the hadith, that Al-Haya is from Iman. And we know the actions of the limbs are from Iman. Why? Because the lowest level of Iman is to move, and move something that is obstructing the people from the path. And the highest level of Iman is to say, La ilaha illallah. And where is La ilaha illallah uttered? Except upon the tongue. So this hadith proves that Iman is in the heart. And it is upon the limbs. And it is upon the tongue. Sheikh Ahmed al Najmi. Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said, Al-Imanu qawlun wa amalun yazidu wa yankus khilafan lil murji'ati Al-Qailina bi annahu la yazid wa la yankus He said that Iman is speech and action. It increases and it decreases. And this is in opposition to the murji'ah. This is in opposition to the murji'ah. Who say that Iman does not increase and it does not decrease. So here we enter into why Imam Ahmad is bringing this point. First of all, of course, because it's the belief of Ahl Sunnah. Secondly, because he's refuting a group that arose before the coming of Imam Ahmad, even before Imam Ahmad. In fact, the Murjia were present in the time of the latter Sahaba. When the last of the Sahaba was still alive, such as Anas ibn Malik, the Murji'a, they appeared. What did the Murji'a say? Exactly what Imam or Sheikh Ahmed al Najmi has said here. The Murji'a, Al Qailina, bi annahu la yazidu wa la yanqus. That this is in opposition to the Murji'a because the Murji'a believe that Iman does not increase and it does not decrease. Because the Murji'a believe that Iman is at one plane. Once you have it, you have it. If it goes, the whole thing goes. There's no such thing as you can have a little bit of Iman. And, you know, it won't go up. So in their eyes, Iman is at one level. If you say to them, no, Iman can be taken, it can be reduced. They say, no, either it is there or it is not there. If it is not there, you're a kafir. If it is there, then you're a believer. So this is the belief of the murji'ah. So they are the murji'ah and they say that iman is not harmed by sin. Of course, imagine. Now you say, well, why do they say that iman is not harmed by sin? Because if you hold that iman, that once you've entered into Islam, your iman is at one level. What level is that? Same as Jibreel, same as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa same as Ibrahim alayhi salam, same as, you know, the best of the, of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So once your Iman is at that level, and it cannot go down, because that's the belief of the Murjia. Once you have it, it doesn't decrease. It doesn't increase, it's at one level. So what effect will sins have upon Iman then? No effect. In their eyes, sins have no effect upon Iman. No matter how much you sin, your Iman won't go down, because it can't go down. It can disappear, but it cannot go down. So once you believe, or once you are a Muslim, the murjia they say that Iman is fixed and sins do not affect the Iman. Just as they say, or just as it is said, <clears throat> that obedience does not benefit in the presence of kufr. Of course, which is true, a kafir. You know, if a person is a disbeliever, a mushrik who's worshipping idols, Make such that to, you know, Shiva and Rama and whatever the Hindus prostrate to or the Christian prostrates to the cross and worships Christ and the cross. Then, of course, if he was to give zakah, would zakah benefit him Yom Al-Qiyamah? Of course not. So what they did was they took the principle in reverse. Right? With deviation. And they said, therefore, 
that Iman is not harmed by sin, just as obedience does not benefit in the presence of kufr. And this is, of course, you know, from the aql, which has no basis in the sharia. In the sharia, yes, we say, a mushrik who prays five times a day, such as a Hindu, let's say you teach him to pray, you just teach him the actions of the prayer, he even says the words in the prayer. Will that benefit him Yawm Al-Qiyamah whilst he is a mushrik? Of course not. Did the Hajj benefit Quraysh? Because they used to perform Hajj and Tawaf, didn't they? They did all of that. Yet, the Hajj did not benefit them. And their Tawaf did not benefit them. And their Dua did not benefit them. Even when they called upon Allah. Why? Because they associated partners in worship with Allah. Whomsoever associates partners in worship with Allah. Then his deeds are nullified. So in the, pres in the presence of major shirk and major kufr. Good deeds will not benefit them. Alright. Does that mean... That the kafir, therefore, therefore he basically should do more and more sins? No, because all the sins will do is will add to the sins or add to the punishment that he will receive Yawm Al-Qiyamah on top of what he's going to receive because of his kufr. So therefore, the point here being that the murji'a hold this belief that iman is not harmed by sin and that is batil and that is futile and that is false and that is against the belief of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. <coughs> And they divided the murjia themselves in their different views and opinions. They divided into 18 sects. And Imam Ahmed said, they are the ones who claim that Iman is just speech of the tongue and that people are not given superiority over another due to Iman. So that's the beliefs from the beliefs of the murjia. They believe that Iman <coughs> that is just speech of the tongue. And that people are not given superiority over one another due to Iman. And that their Iman and the Iman of the angels or their faith and the faith of the angels and the prophet and the prophets is one and the same. They claim that Iman does not increase or decrease. And that there is no istithna. We'll come back to that in a moment. And they, believe, and they do not believe in istithna. And the one who merely professes Iman upon the tongue and performs no righteous deeds, then he is rightfully a believer, meaning that he's perfect in Iman. Right? And this is mentioned by Ibn Abi Ya'la in Tabaqat al Hanabila. But, the, but some of the things that you can extract from this, these, these words is that as far as the murjia are concerned, the Iman of the most evil Muslim who murders, fornicates, lies, steals, doesn't fast, doesn't give zakah, doesn't perform hajj, is, is uh, disobedient to his parents, and whatever other sins that you can think of. They believe that so long as he uttered la ilaha illallah, then such a person, his iman is no different to the iman of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Right, so long as he has belief in the heart, and so long as he utters that upon the tongue, right, depending on which of the sects of the murjia, because the murjia have various sects, but let's just stick to the basic one. So they believe that so long as you utter la ilaha illallah, then whatever of these sins, and I could list, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 sins that they commit, it will not harm them. And their iman will be the same level as the prophets, the messengers, the angels, and so on. That you cannot decrease it. It will not be decreased by their actions. And likewise they believe. That. Just by merely professing that. Upon the tongue. And, and without performing righteous deeds. That he is. He has perfected iman. There is no difference between him and Muhammad. Wasallam, in terms of iman. Why? Because they believe that iman is what? At one level. It cannot go down. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala he stated in Majmu al-Fatawa volume 7 page 195 he said the murjia are, are of three types the first of them are those who say that iman is merely in the heart that faith is only in the heart belief is in the heart then they are of two types those who say that belief is in the heart or iman is in the heart, they themselves are of two types. Those who hold the actions of the heart 
enter into Iman. And they are the majority of the murjia. Right? So they say that Iman is what? Speech of the heart and action of the heart. So you must have, you know, alongside having tasdeeq or having belief that Allah is the sole one deserving, of, deserving to be worshipped and Muhammad is the final messenger and they believe in their hearts that angels actually, you know, exist and the angel of the revelation is Jibreel and so on and Munkar and Nakir. So they believe in all of that in the heart. Alongside that, they believe in the actions of the heart, meaning that they fear. They believe in the actions that there must be hope and fear and love and desire and tawakkul and so on. So that's one group of the, that is the first sect of the, of the murji'a and one type of them of the first sect. Those who say that iman is merely in the heart. Then there's another group who believe that iman is merely in the heart. And they are even worse than the first one. Those who do not enter actions of the heart into the affair of iman. So they don't even believe that you need to have actions of the heart. And this is, these are the Jahmiya, the followers of Jahm bin Safwan. So what makes them so evil? What makes them so evil is that they believe that just ma'rifa alone makes a person perfect in iman. Ma'rifa meaning that he recognizes God, ex Allah exists. Just by recognizing without love, hope, fear, desire, without the testimony of faith, just ma'rifa itself, because they held that jahl is kufr. If you don't believe in the existence of Allah, you're a kafir. If you believe in the existence of Allah, then you're a believer with iman like Muhammad and Jibreel and so on. Upon that, Iblis is a believer because he knows Allah exists. Right? Fir'aun is a believer. Abu Jahl is a believer. Abu Lahab is a believer. Abu Talib is a believer. In fact, there are no disbelievers really. In essence, amongst those mushrikeen. No disbelievers because they all believed or they had knowledge of the, they affirmed the existence of a creator, Allah. So this is the, this is the irja of the Jahmiyyah. It is the, it is the worst type. And this is why the Jahmiyyah kuffar. The Jahmiyyah who held this belief were regarded to be outside of the fold of Islam. So that's the first sect. Those who say that Iman is merely in the heart. The second sect those who say it is merely speech of the tongue. Nothing to do with the heart. So, so long as you utter it upon the tongue, you're a believer with Iman like Jibreel and the prophets and the messengers. And your Iman cannot decrease. You are in Jannah. Just as the first sect they said. So long as you have these, it's done. Because your Iman is complete. Right? So they say it is merely of the tongue. And that is a sect known as the Karramiyah. Now that necessitates that even if you don't believe in the heart, you just utter it upon the tongue, they regard that person to be a believer. Karramiya. So that would necessitate what? That all of the munafiqun are believers perfect in Iman. Wouldn't it? Because they say upon the tongue, whilst they do not believe in their hearts. So Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul and all of those munafiqin that were around him in Medina, in the time of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as far as this sect is concerned, they are mu'minun. Completing Iman at one level without it being able to diminish or reduce. Then the third, the third sect of the Murji'a. And remember, each of these branches off into other sects. That's why they are 18 plus sects of the Murji'a. At least 18. So these are the three under which all of the others divide. The third sect of the Murji'a, they say that Iman is belief in the heart, speech upon the tongue, and actions of the limbs are not from Iman. Actions of the limbs do not come into Iman. So they believe it is in the heart and upon the speech. 
right? So this is the call of the Murjiatul Fuqaha. Murjiatul Fuqaha, or the, the Murjia amongst the jurists, referring here to the Hanafis. Of the four madhabs, the Hanafis, they fell into this era. Abu Hanifa fell into it. Right? Rahimahullah ta'ala. But the Hanafis for centuries, they followed that qawl. And this is why you find it in their books of Aqeedah. And in their teachings till this day. And this is the belief of the Maturidiyya. Also. Right? Because, you know, they took on that belief. And the Ashaira. The actions are not from Iman. So what do they believe? It is belief in the heart. Speech upon the tongue. As for the actions of the limbs, then they are not from Iman. And they believe that Iman does not increase and it does not decrease. These are the Murjiatul Fuqaha. This is not the belief of Ahlul Sunnah. However, does that necessitate that the scholars, they say that Abu Hanifa was not from Ahlul Sunnah? Then the scholars fell into two, two broad camps. And Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz and many of the other scholars, including Ibn Taymiyyah and others, that they regarded him to be a person who made ijtihad and he was mistaken. He was erroneous. And the others were much harsher against him. They said no. That he erred. And he erred in a point of aqidah. But the position that the majority they take is that they say that Abu Hanifa rahimullah, was, in, was erroneous because to, to, to say that Iman does not increase and decrease and that actions are not from Iman, then it is a, it is a, a, a aqidah bid'iyah. It is a belief that is a bid'i belief. It is an innovative belief. So now the point is, is he, did he do it knowingly, calling to it, after the proof was established? This is where the scholars, they differ. Some say, no, he knew, therefore they are very harsh against him from, from his own era. And from the era that came, and, the, and from of the, some of the generations that came after him. Then likewise, people of his era and the generations that came after him excused him. They said the truth didn't reach him. And he was, you know, he made, an, he made a very erroneous ijtihad and he fell into error. But as for the, those who followed him in the error after knowing it, then it is bid'ah. And that's why the Asha'ira, the Maturidiyya, the Murjiya, who believe the actions, do, that, that Iman does not increase and decrease, we say that they are from Ahlul Bid'ah. Whoever says that Iman is fixed and he does not increase and decrease. And the actions are not from Iman. This is the belief of the Murji'ah. So once they are informed that if you take this belief, then you have agreed with the Murji'ah. Even though we, are, we have all of these evidences from the Kitab and the Sunnah. And he persists, then what is he? He's Murji. Right? It is not to be said, no, he is like us. He is like either Iman increases or decreases or it doesn't. They cannot coexist, can they? Right? In the Aqeedah, it cannot coexist. The Ahlul Sunnah either believe Iman increases and decreases and actions are from Iman or Ahlul Sunnah believe in the opposite. Those who believe that actions are speech or Iman is speech and action increases and it decreases. Then they are Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Whomsoever says, no, Iman is speech. Speech of the heart speech of the tongue, action of the heart, but not actions of the limbs. And it does not increase and decrease. Then such a person is an innovator, is a mubtadiyah. And this is why you find the books of Aqeedah, Salafiyah, like exactly what we've read here from Imam Ahmed. And you can read it in, you know, several hundred other works of Aqeedah from the Salaf. Same thing. They will all have this point. Why? Because it became prevalent amongst the murjia of that time that Iman does not increase and decrease and actions are not from Iman. So that needs to be made clear. However, having said that, you say, but the Hanafis believe they do outward actions. Yes, they do. Because they don't deny the obligation of the outward action. They don't say, well, there's no prayer, there's no zakah. They're not like the, the Jahmiyyah from the murjia. Right? They are not of that level. And they are not like the, you know, some of the more, uh, you know, the first set that we mentioned. Or the Karramiya even. So they are not from the, 
from those, that sect of the murjah who believes that iman is only in the heart. So they believe that actions are to be performed. That's why if you speak to a Hanafi, he'll say, yeah, salah is wajib. Zakah is wajib or fard. All right? That's what they'll tell you. And likewise with hajj and so on. But they'll say it is obligatory on the basis that Allah has obligated it in the Quran. And the Prophet ﷺ has obligated it in the sunnah. So on that basis, they will hold it to be obligatory. But if you tell them, is it, is it not from iman? They'll say, no, because iman is belief in the heart and speech on the tongue. They'll even tell you, if you don't pray, you'll be under the threat of Allah's punishment. They hold that. But in this particular arena, they say iman does not increase and decrease. It does not. It does not go up and down. And that's why when you listen to the explanations of al-aqidah tahawiyyah, Aqidat al-Tahawiyah of uh, Sheikh bin Baz or Sheikh bin Uthaymeen or Sheikh al-Fawzan or even Ibn Abil Iz from the Middle Ages that when they come to this point in the creed of Imam al-Tahawi they're very stern very stern and they say upon that point because of course you know the creed of Imam al-Tahawi there is that vagueness with regard to what is Iman. So therefore, Ibn Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions, he'll say things like, this is batil. This point here, without its tafsil, without the extra detail that is required in the definition of Iman, it is batil. And then he'll correct it. Because that's what Ahlul Sunnah do. To Ahlul Sunnah. But once the correction is made, then the followers have no excuse to follow blindly in matters of aqidah. In matters of aqidah, you don't say, well, I'm, you know, in aqidah, I'm just going to follow, you know, the, the, the murjat al-fuqaha. And I'm going to follow, you know, the, the ash'ari madhab or the maturidi madhab. In aqidah, no, you're not excused. In aqidah, it is obligatory to follow the haqq and not blindly follow the people. Barakallahu feekum. It is not permissible to do that. And just say, my madhab is ash'ari. No, your madhab should be ahlul sunnah, ahlul hadith, sahaba radiyallahu anhum. So that is a discussion on the murjia. Then, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi, he mentions, regarding the murjia, they are the ones who claim that the iman of the fusaq, the iman of the open sinners from the Muslims, and the iman of Jibreel, alayhi salam is the same wahada batil and this is falsehood this is false and the quran it proves that iman the ayat the ayat of the quran they prove that iman increases so these are the ayat of ziyadatul iman of the iman increasing and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned wa yazdad alladhina amanu imanan وَلَا يَرْتَابَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ And the believe, so that the, and, and, and so that the believers may increase in Iman, Allah mentions, يَزْدَادَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِمَانًا And the believers may increase in Iman, and no doubt may be left for the people of the book. From Surah, uh, Surah Al-Mudathir, ayah number 31. So the point here being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly said, that the believers, their iman may increase. And likewise, the statement of Allah, وَيَزِيدُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ اَحْتَدَوْا هُدًا That Allah increases in guidance those who walk the straight path. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases the people in guidance and increases them. In, and there are so many ayat from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that mentioned increase in iman. Naam. So then he said, and other than these two from the various ayat, and this is from Surah Maryam, the second ayah that he quoted, and there are many others, barakallahu feekum. And the Salaf used to say that whatever is liable to increase is also liable to decrease. So Iman can increase to the, to the, to the strength of mountains, and it can decrease up until it reaches the weight of an atom or a mustard seed and that people are of different levels of iman just as in the statement of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
when he said in a hadith that has been collected by Bukhari and by Muslim that the people of Jannah will look at the people dwelling in the chambers above them. The people of paradise will look at the people dwelling in the chambers, chambers above them in the same way that people look at a bright star shining far away on the horizon in the east or the west due to their superiority over them. So they asked, Ya Rasulullah, are those the dwellings of the prophets that no one else can attain? He said, no. By the one in whose hand is my soul, they are for men who believed in Allah and affirmed the truthfulness of the messengers. So this proves that those people who believed in Allah and affirmed the truthful of the messengers and followed them, that there will be differences between them. Such that a person will be in one level of Jannah and he will look at the chambers above them like one of you looks into the west or into the east at the shining star. That's the differences in paradise. And what is that for? Except for their differing levels of Iman. And likewise, what also proves that people are of different levels of Iman is the Hadith of Shafa'ah. And that Allah, the Most High, said to the angels, Take out of the fire whomsoever has in his heart even a dinar weight of goodness. Then take out of the fire anyone who has even half a dinar weight of goodness. And in a narration, take out of the fire anyone who has even half a dinar weight of iman. Then, he's, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands them to take out of the hellfire even the person who has a seed's weight of iman or a mustard seed weight of iman up until Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said take out of, the, out of the fire the one who has lesser than that and the one who has even lesser than that to the weight of an atom of iman take them out of the hellfire. The hadith reported by Bukhari and Muslim. So what does that tell you? That Iman can reach the weight of an atom or a mustard seed or half a dinar or a whole of a dinar. All of this proves that Iman decreases and decreases and decreases up until there is hardly anything remaining. And who are they? They are in the hellfire. Why are they in the hellfire? Because of the deficiency in their Iman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cast a group of people into the hellfire. Others Allah will forgive. Like the man who, you know, had 99 scrolls of evil deeds. And they were placed on one side of the scale. And he said to him, do you have anything good? He said, no. Do you deny any of this? No. Rather, you have something. And they bring out a small parchment, but the hadith of the bataqa. What is written on the parchment? La ilaha illallah. And it outweighs all of the 99 scrolls of evil deeds. This is the mercy of Allah. Nevertheless, there will still be a group of people that Allah will cast into the hellfire. And then he will command the angels to take them out after they have been punished in the fire as a purification for them. And as we mentioned in one of the previous lessons, that there will be a group of Muslims that will be burnt into ashes and then sprinkled onto the banks of the rivers in the courtyards of Jannah up until and then the people and, and then water will be poured upon them from the river and they will sprout just like a seed sprouts from the uh, from the mud left over of a flood from a flood so here we know that there are people in the hellfire with very very weak iman but it is sufficient to save them it will save them their Iman will save them because they testified to La ilaha illallah and they had an atom's weight of Iman. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this proves that Iman is of different levels. And likewise, in paradise, there are different levels where the people will enter into the different chambers and levels of Jannah due to their Iman and their piety. 
And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith regarding the mu'min al-qawi, regarding the believer who is strong and the believer who is da'if and weak. He said a strong believer is better than a weak believer. The strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than a weak believer. Although in both there is good. But who's got more good out of the two? The strong believer. Because he's closer to Allah. He does more righteous deeds. The hadith, that hadith reported in Muslim. So therefore, this is our belief, Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, in Iman. We believe in the hadith, in the hadith of the Shafa'ah, of the intercession, which is denied by the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij. Because they say the major sinners, there's no Shafa'ah, they're kuffar. So they will not be interceded for Yawm al Qiyamah. So the Khawarij and the Murji'a, they went to two extremes. But at some point, they had some convergence. And maybe in another dars, we can mention the convergence between the Murji'a and the Khawarij. Because both of them believe in certain... And Istithna also I mentioned earlier that the Murji'a, they do not believe in Istithna. And that is to say that I am a believer, inshallah. They don't say that you can say inshallah. They say, if you say inshallah, then you have introduced doubt into your iman. You have introduced doubt into your iman because to them inshallah means that you're, what do you mean? Are you a believer or not inshallah? What do you mean inshallah? Why? Because once you're a believer, you're at one level, right? You're at one level. It does not decrease. So how can you say, and it, and it does not increase. How can you say, inshallah? So, the characteristic of the murjia is, tarkul istithna. The abandonment of making an exception. Because when you say, I'm a believer, inshallah, meaning that I believe in Allah. No doubt, there's yaqeen. I believe in the last day. I believe in the angels, I believe in the books, I believe in the messengers, all of them. I believe in, you know, the pre-decree, I believe in everything that Allah has revealed. I'm certain of that. So when a person says, I'm a believer, inshallah, meaning only Allah knows whether I have perfected iman. Because Islam, or the religion is of three levels, is it not? Islam, Iman, Ihsan. Is it not? From the Hadith of Jibreel. So, Islam is the first level. Iman is the second level. And Ihsan is perfection. So when a person says, are you a believer? You say, well, if you mean, do I believe in Allah? And the angels, and the books, and the messengers, and the last day, and the punishment of the grave, and Munkar and Nakir. And Jibreel sending down the bringing down the revelation to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Do I believe in pre-decree and the levels of pre-decree? It's good and it's evil. Yes, I believe in all of that, and I have no doubt in that. Am I am I a believer in the sense that I perfected iman? Inshallah, Allah knows best. That's why the, it is permissible for a Muslim, and rather it is a must for a Muslim to say, "Are you a believer?" Inshallah. They say, do you believe in Allah? Yes, yaqeen. Because from the conditions of the kalima is what? Yaqeen. Ilm and yaqeen. So we are certain that we believe in the testimony, la ilaha illallah. But as for saying, I am a believer, then the murjiyad, if you say, I am a believer, inshallah, they say, ah, oh, you got shak in your iman. Say, no, we don't have shak in our iman. I am saying that all of the deeds that I'm doing, number one, will Allah accept them? Does it raise me to a level of a mu'min? Have I done enough? Will Allah accept them? Is, there, is it mixed with anything such as riya or sum'a? Then Allah knows best. So we say, I'm a believer if Allah wills. I'm a believer if Allah wills. So the issue is tafsili, and this is why 
the murjia they used to go around testing the people by saying to them are you a mu'min you don't find this test from the kitab and the sunnah and the way of the sahaba radiyallahu anhum right you don't find that test are you a believer that's why when they came one of them he came to imam al-awza'i who was in sham and one of them said to him uh, are you a believer he said are you from iraq because this is where irja came from right because he's testing him is he going to say inshallah or not say inshallah is he going to say naam and just stop there and of course it is permissible or rather it is you know uh, it, it, it is the way of the believer when he is, if he is asked, not that you should be asking that question, but if someone asks, hey, inshallah, inshallah, if Allah accepts it from me, that my deeds raise me to the level of a believer. Do you believe in Allah? Of course I believe in Allah. You have yaqeen? Of course I have yaqeen. Are you certain Allah will raise you? Of course I'm certain Allah will raise me. I just pray that Allah raises me in a condition that is good and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's our discussion briefly on the topic of Iman and the Murji'a and how it contrasts with the belief of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'a. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Jazakumullahu khairah. That first narration, I did say I was going to come back to it. I didn't. The narration, Akmalul Mu'minina Imanan Ahsanuhum Khuluqa. That narration is the Sunan of Abu Dawud.